this Ignatian year. Welcome to another episode of this Ignatian year. Today we are joined by Terrence M. Sawyer, the 25th president of Loyola University, Maryland. Terry's career at Loyola started in 1998 as a special assistant to the president for government and community relations, where he worked extensively to create and maintain positive relationships with Loyola's neighboring communities and government officials. Since then, he has served as vice president for administration, vice president for advancement, and most recently as senior vice president. In addition, he is an affiliate professor in Loyola's Selinger School of Business and Management. Under Terry's leadership, Loyola has raised more than $100 million through the Bright Minds Bold Hearts campaign. He has also led the advancement team in raising funds for capital projects, including the recently opened and magnificent Fernandez Center. He was also instrumental in developing and launching the York Road Initiative. Terry is a graduate of the Ignatian Colleagues Program, has completed the spiritual exercises, and participated in an immersion experience in El Salvador. In June 2016, Terry walked in the steps of St. Ignatius on pilgrimage through Spain and Italy. A native of Wayne, New Jersey, Terry earned his bachelor's degree in government and politics from the University of Maryland College Park, a Juris Doctorate degree from Widener University School of Law, and completed the Harvard Graduate School of Education's Institute for Educational Management Program. Terry's wife, Courtney, is a speech pathologist who earned her Master's of Science in Speech Language Pathology from Loyola University of Maryland. And they have three sons, the eldest son who is currently serving with Jesuit Volunteer Corps, and their two younger sons who are currently enroll enrolled in college. It is our great honor to welcome Terry Sawyer, Loyola's 25th president, to this Ignatian Year podcast. Terry, welcome to the podcast and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Paula. It is great to be here with both of you. Terry, it is such an honor to have you this morning and we're so lucky to have you at Loyola. Well, thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, so we'll get started because I know we're, you're very busy, a very busy man, which is why we're also very, very uh, lucky and honored to, that you took time to be with us today. Um, the first question we have for you is we're just wondering, we're, so we're celebrating this podcast in the context of the Ignatian year. Mm. Uh, it's been 500 years since the conversion of St. Ignatius. And, uh, at, you know, as Sean said, you've gone through the spiritual exercises, you've done the Ignatian pilgrimage, ICP. How did you come to Ignatian spirituality? What was your first experience, if you can share with yeah. us? That, well, first of all, let me just say the honor is mine. I'm honored to be here with both of you, and I'm so grateful for the work that you do. And I'm so grateful to be at a Jesuit university. Uh, and I am a believer that you sort of end up where you're supposed to be. If you live a prayerful and somewhat reflective life, I'm not monastic in any way, but you know, if you sort of pay attention to what's, what's, what's stirring inside you, you ultimately end up where you're supposed to be. And I'm convinced that that's sort of my story because it started very differently. I mean, I was a, I was a litigator um, in Baltimore City District Court how I ended up as the president of a Jesuit university, I can only imagine that the Holy Spirit had something to do with that. Um, how I originally got exposed to Jesuit spirituality was really through my father, who is class of 1952, St. Peter's College, which is a Jesuit university in Jersey City, New Jersey. And my father, who was a veteran of the Korean War, um, you know, uh, kind of old school in some ways, attributed all good in his life when we were kids to his Jesuit education, as he would call it. He was Jesuit trained, he would say. And we grew up and still are Catholics. And we would go to mass and uh, at Our Lady of Consolation Church in Wayne, New Jersey. And in the summers, often we would have a visiting priest. And if my father liked him based on the quality and content of his homily and his style, my father would immediately declare to all of us in the pew, this guy's definitely a Jesuit, definitely a Jesuit, very sharp, very sharp. And if my father was unimpressed with the man on the altar, he would declare to us, 
this guy, definitely not a Jesuit. Definitely, but definitely not. So I grew up with this sort of awe and this sort of um, um, reverence for the Jesuits. Flash forward to 1997, and I meet a real life Jesuit, Father Ridley, the president of Loyola. I was an attorney for the state and they were doing a big project and Father Ridley needed help and I was assigned to him and his team. And within like minutes, I could see firsthand what my father was talking about. I'd never met a priest like this the, with his wit and his, his deep resources of literature and references and, and, and acumen and business sense and savvy. It was just like you were almost seeing like a superhero. And I said, okay, so this is, this is what I've been hearing about all this time about the Jesuits. And then to this day, I don't really know if I was fired or traded, but soon after that meeting, I realized I now work at Loyola um, and the rest is history as they say. And so that was a fairly superficial understanding of what Jesuit spirituality was. But Jesuit education, in my view, has a style. It has a feel to it that's sometimes hard to articulate. And I gleaned that in that moment, in that initial meeting. And then it's only grown since there and become deeper. And I find the more I dig into Jesuit spirituality, the more my commitment to this institution grows, the more our ability to deal with what I'll just kind of call trivial and some kind, sometimes pesky matters that are necessary when you're running an institution and can bring you down because they're just, they're pesky um, and they can feel trivial. When you're connected to the mission, it gives you sort of the uplift that you need to just remind yourself, why are we doing all this? What is the purpose? And I'm convinced that Jesuit spirituality through the lens and through the auspices of Jesuit education is absolutely worth our time, our effort, and our endeavors. And so it, it gives me a jolt every time I get up in the morning and come here. And so just to close, um, with this sort of general understanding, I've been afforded the opportunity to go deeper in an understanding of Jesuit spirituality through programs like the Ignatian Colleagues Program which I can't remember the year I did it. I was cohort four. I think they're on like cohort in the high teens, maybe. And, you know, that was the first time I really sat down and read, um, you know, the history of St. Ignatius beyond what you can kind of get on like a website of a, of a Jesuit university to really understand what was behind the spiritual exercise and then experience it. If you know me, um, I'm a fairly extroverted person that has a tendency to probably talk too much. Um, the spiritual exercise is about calming yourself. I think I started my silent retreat on a Sunday. I don't think I lowered my shoulders until about Wednesday when it actually a piece set in. And by the way, I was petrified of doing that. And now I crave it. I crave that time of just silence because it's so hard to, for me sometimes, to stop the voices and the, don't be scared. They're not crazy voices, I don't think. But you know, to stop the constant chatter of what about this? What about this? I gotta do this, I forgot about this. Um, and to have that time. And I think Ignatius was so wise. I mean, I think modern day psychology reflects the need for, and this whole movement now around meditation, around mindfulness is so Ignatian in so many ways. Uh, and I know that there were Eastern influences in Ignatian's own understanding. I also think it's interesting that St. Ignatius um, developed this, uh, the spiritual exercises as a lay person, which is, gives me a certain amount of hope as a lay leader of a Jesuit university that you can do important spiritual things uh, as a lay person. And then walking in his steps was so powerful and being in the room where he had his convalescence actually in the room and celebrating mass with Father Brown in that room, the actual room, where the man, the real person, it's not a mythical figure. And then also concluding that week in the room where he died and also having mass in that room and seeing his shoes on the floor, it's just so impactful. And it so humanizes a person and it reminds us all that we all have the ability. He's a, he was a, just a regular guy that decided to have an extraordinary life. And that is a lesson for us we all have that opportunity if we choose to grab the mantle 
and take it on. So that's a brief, thank you for that question because it was kind of fun to kind of walk through that. That was a, that's a brief summary of my um, encounter uh, and very much still a novice in learning about uh, St. Ignatius and Ignatian spirituality. Harry, thanks for sharing that. I, you know, I think one of the, the things that I've come to really love about the Ignatian year is it's just, it's an opportunity to introduce members of our community to the life of Ignatius, right? And, and we have members who, who come, uh, much like your story, who, who have had some connection from their family, you know? Um, and, and we also have people, uh, as you know, who are coming to Loyola and maybe <clears throat> they're not familiar with Ignatius, but, but it's the mission. Um, it's the educational model, right? And something has drawn them here and how do we introduce them? So I, I, I thank you for, for sharing kind of how you were introduced to Ignatius. I think that's an important part of, of this Ignatian year as we meet with people and say, how have you met Ignatian along, Ignatius around the, on the road? And as, as you talked about that, you started to already lean into my next question, which, um, you know, as we talk about aspects of Ignatian spirituality, you, you talked about silence, you talked about um, discernment, um, you talked about tr some trust, right? Um, ways of being on the road and following um, where God is calling you ultimately, and, and that you, you named so well in, in Ignatius, the, the discernment, how do, we, how do we filter out all the demands, and I can only imagine as a president that you have a few demands, um, and a lot of voices um, coming to your doorstep, and so as we think about this Ignatian year, as, we, as we're talking about St. Ignatius and Ignatian spirituality, um, you, you've already touched on some of the aspects, but I'm, I'm curious if you wanted to elaborate um, on what what aspect, um, either of the life from the life of Saint Ignatius or the of Ignatian spirituality, has really informed or shaped your leadership today? Yeah. Well, oh, that's such a big question. Um, there's so much, um, so many lessons to be learned. Um, you know, for one, I think it's really helpful that Saint Ignatius's story is one of a person that started on a particular road as a warrior. And as I just kind of what I've, what I've read and what I, what, I, what I know of him is in his younger days is that he wasn't necessarily a virtuous person. I'm sure he had a good heart, but he chased a lot of things uh, that weren't necessarily pious, I would argue, um, and then had this conversion, right? And so I think that immediately starts from a level of relatability, right? We can all relate to that. This isn't a person that seemed to be born with these virtues that we can't relate to. This is a regular guy, you know, having a good time, cared a lot about how he looked, right? Apparently he was very vain, um, wanted glory, and then decides, I'm actually finding that these things aren't really filling me up. They're very temporary. We could look at our own world right now and see the, the, the obsession with consumerism and materialism. All these things that we know um, might give you a jolt of adrenaline in the minute, but they're very, very empty. Uh, and if you don't have things like love and care and compassion and relationships, and you don't understand how good it feels to help other people, to truly be a man or woman for and with others, right? What we say we stand for that if you don't have those things, you have a pretty empty existence. Um, and so you try to fill that hole with, you know, drugs or alcohol or all different kinds of vices that we know are, are harmful. So there's an immediate relatability. And I think there's also that relatability to Jesuit spirituality, and then through our lens, Jesuit education, which it's relatable. There's a pragmatism to it. Um, when I think about my own encounter I didn't start to work at Loyola necessarily because, or primarily because it was a Jesuit university. And in fact, when I started working here, I didn't think I'd be here very long. I thought it would be get this project done and then I'll go back to practicing law. But what I realized was you can actually work at a place that aligns, that stands for things that align so squarely with what you, what you hope for, for yourself and for your family and for the world. If you can find that, in where you go to work every day, there's, that's a grace. And so I am trying to answer your question. There's a pragmatism to um, 
and a realism to, for me, at least, to Ignatian spirituality that I that I love. You mentioned discernment. Um, as educators, I think ultimately, really, what we're trying to when we talk about Ignatian citizens, it's it's um, I think creating students and then thereby citizens that truly go through the exercise of discernment. And when we talk about it, of course, we acknowledge, we expect people of goodwill to know the difference between choosing something that's good and choosing something that's evil, which is on display in our world as we're sitting here. But what about choosing between goods? And we're often in these positions that feel very heavy and so much stress on so many people. I see our students, what should I major in, right? Which we look back at it and say, oh, maybe, maybe that's not the, the most world um, shattering decision. But when you're in the moment, that's a really big deal because you're thinking, what am I going to do with my life? And what I love about Ignatius's approach, and again, it goes back to silence, is that a true discernment is when you sit and listen and imagine, use your imagination and pick your, to yourself in, in, in either setting, in, in, the, in the two choices, and pay attention to the stirrings, as they talk about, that are inside you. And I think that's a very mature way to think about how God speaks to us. When I was a kid, and I would say prayers, I would expect like a voice from the clouds to come down, right? I mean, that's not, obviously, we know that's not how it works. Um, but when you listen to the, the, the stirrings inside you, how does it make you feel? Um, which one brings you sustained joy? I think that's really listening to the voice of God. That's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And I've had to make some pretty important decisions for myself about what I want to do. Do I want to put myself out there? Do I really want to take this on? There's a lot of risk. Um, and, you know, there, you're on a high wire without a net. And by the way, gang, I don't have tenure. So, you know, that's really on a high wire without a net. So did I want to expose myself? The other thing is, when you take this job, we all want to be liked. I, I, don't, I don't love criticism, but you have to be prepared to know that just about every decision you make, and you have to make a couple a day, there's going to be people that don't like it, and they're going to tell you that they don't like it. So I had to discern, is this what I want to do? Is this what I think is best for the university? Is this my best way to serve Loyola and to ultimately serve God? And I followed that process, and, and I guess the jury's still out. But I can tell you, for me, yes, I no regrets. This is actually what I want to do. So discernment is an important aspect of Jesuit spirituality um, that I think about and that struck me a lot in my life. You know, and then lastly, I think also is the, um, the notion, and, and I believe Ignatius came to this late in life. He didn't start the, the Society of Jesus for sole purpose of creating schools. But the notion, when we think about what we do every day, the notion that education is the great liberator, um, an educated mind, particularly if you're educated in the humanities and the liberal arts, you have the skills and the ability to make decisions that are not only good for you and your family, but ultimately and most importantly, good for the world. And you understand things like the arts and history and literature um, and um, the human condition. Um, and when you're versed in those things, I think only then can we truly have faith in a free society and in our purposes in our country and in other parts of the world, which is being, you know, fought for right now as we speak, democracy. And so um, that's another element of Ignatian spirituality that certainly reminds me that the work that we do here, while imperfect, is noble. Thank you so much for emphasizing um, the, the importance of silence, especially for someone uh, in, in your position where you're, um, you know, uh, torn into so many different directions and have to be constantly be on the go. That importance of just really saying, you know, I need to set this time aside just to think and to reflect. And I imagine that in for someone in your position, it's even more important to carve out that space. Um, and it's so very Ignatian. Uh, so we had another question. Um, is there a certain Catholic Jesuit individual beyond St. Ignatius who you draw inspiration from? Well, you know, I guess the easy, but I, I've got to I've got to cite it uh, because it's so it means a lot to me and to so many. I hope I think I know. Uh, is Pope Francis. 
I mean, you know, it's so powerful to have a Jesuit as our Holy Father. And I think we've all noticed the fact that he's leading the church through what I would call extremely compelling conversations, not without controversy, without controversy, very Ignatian in my view. It is important to ask tough questions and have faith that if we truly ask questions and seek truth, that will ultimately lead us closer to God. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. And I think Pope Francis has shown a lot of courage uh, and has taken stands that he knew would bring back immediate backlash. Um, but he's ultimately asking critical questions um, about the church and about us as Catholics. I also think that his displayed heart and true authentic heart, care, and concern for the poor um, is something that resonates with me um, and I think resonates strongly for what our institutions stand for. Um, working very hard to make sure that we have an institution for which cost is not a barrier for students to attend, um, where we're doing what we can in, in our community to make sure that we are paying attention to folks that have been historically marginalized, that are materially poor, um, and doing everything we can to uplift. And as I said before, there is nothing more uplifting than education. And one of the, you know, when you're in higher education, you like to throw around a lot of stats. Um, the statistic that I'm most proud of is that, and pardon the business lingo for a second, but that the return on investment for low-income students at Loyola is one of the highest in the country. We should be really proud of that. I'm personally really proud of that. Um, and then lastly, um, Pope Francis's really strong stand on caring for our common home. Uh, just recently, a study came out of the UN that talks about how perilous um, our circumstance is around the environment. And Pope Francis has used his platform to talk to us that it is a moral imperative that we um, take on the cause of sustainability uh, and ensuring that we do everything we can to protect our planet, which was created by our creator. Um, and if we don't, we do so at our peril. Um, and I don't think it's living our mission if we're not actively engaged in that kind of work. So, so Pope Francis, certainly. When I went to El Salvador, I got to become familiar with um, Pedro Arupe, who was a very important in the renewal of the Society of Jesus after Vatican II, um, and has a saying that we use a lot, which I love, which is fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. Um, I've heard that uttered many times before, here at Loyola before I realized it was Pedro Arupe that said it. I think there were some Jesuits here that maybe were claiming they uh, came up with that phrase. Maybe not. Um, I, I just think there's some beautiful poignancy to that. And as a president of a university that's been here for 23 years, uh, those are words that speak to my heart. And then lastly, um, a Catholic figure that I recently became aware of, which I find quite inspiring, is Thea Bowman. As some of you might know, we named uh, a residence hall after Thea Bowman and um, was really uh, moved. I was really moved by the work that she has done, um, the courage and the fight that she has against prejudice and racial injustice and the work that she's done for Catholics of color. Um, so she is uh, someone that I just really feel um, is brave, inspiring um, and someone that I really admire. Terry, thanks for, there's so much in that, just that answer. Uh, we, we could run, do an ongoing series here uh, of conversations. And this is what we found throughout the Ignatian Year podcast is as we have these conversations that the, the, the reflections that um, people are offering are just so rich. And, you know, you, you talked about Ignatius, you've talked about discernment you've talked about leadership you, you talked about making hard decisions right making decisions between goods um and and then you talked about some of the different leaders uh that you are carrying with you companions maybe on your journey your companions uh in the presidency um and and as you as you named Arupe Pedro Arupe you know one of the things that as you were talking about making hard decisions he he gave us also you know the idea of the faith that does justice right the service mm -hmm. of faith and promotion of justice and and in doing so 
also, um, not everybody opened, welcomely opened him in moving the direction of uh, forward, um, but he was a man who also was steeped in Ignatian spirituality, and there were pieces of that and aspects of that that helped shape him along with his own story of being in Japan when one of the nuclear bombs was dropped um, and shaping the, his worldview. And you've talked about some of the things that have shaped your worldview as a leader. And I'm, and I'm curious, you've talked about these Ignatian aspects. I'm curious if there are any, um, as, you, as a leader, are there any values? You, you know, I've heard you talk about trust, having to trust your discernment, having to trust mm -hmm. that God is calling you to this moment. And, and even when, you know, the, the, you've put yourself out there, but you, you've had to trust, um, you know, and I'm curious if, if that is a guiding value for you in your leadership in your life, and if there are other values that um, you, you hold tight to as you, as you navigate leadership in the world. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. You know, so trust is an interesting one to start with. Um, it seems so obvious, yet so elusive, I think, oftentimes in leadership. Um, you know, not just in, in higher ed or at Loyola, but in the world. And when you lose trust, first of all, it's very hard to get it back. Um, and if you have trust, which is, has to be earned and has to be based on demonstrated experience, um, now so more than ever, because we become so cynical, particularly of anything institutional. Um, but if you have trust as a foundational element, there's so much you can do and accomplish. And when, when mistakes are made, for example, which they're going to be made, um, you get the benefit of the doubt. If at your core, people trust that what you're trying to do is for the right reasons, it's not for selfish or nefarious reasons, it's ultimately to achieve a good for the greater, the greater whole. And of course, we're not gonna have a perfect record in terms of, should we go left or should we right? Should we do this or should we do that? But if you have trust as a foundation, you know, and you, if you acknowledge failures and mistakes, which is a part of gaining trust, when you're willing to admit that was a mistake or, you know, to say you're sorry, if you do something, you offend someone, hurt someone um, unintentionally. Um, and when you have that trust, it's such, a, it's such a foundational element to being successful, again, not for yourself, but for what you're trying to accomplish, which is to, for in my instance, um, uh, what's best for this university. And more importantly, not the university as an abstract entity, but the people of this university, the people that work here, the people that teach here, the people that go to school to learn here, the alums that went here and wanna be proud of their institution and continue to extract knowledge and wisdom and motivation from it. We have an obligation to all those constituencies, to our city. Uh, and that's the one thing, the biggest adjustment for me in this job, I know you didn't ask this, but um, is, um, is the number of constituencies you're ultimately responsible for. It's a little overwhelming, to be honest, um, but manageable. Um, so, so yeah, so, so trust is essential. It's a foundational element. And if you lose it, um, as I said in the beginning of my comments, very, very hard to, to get it back. So you must protect it with everything you have. Thank and you, there's Terry. The, uh, just very quickly, as someone whose scholarship centers on trust, I have to say that another thing that we sometimes also miss is just how the act of trusting contributes to people's well-being. So yeah. all of us, if we feel that we are in a community where we can trust others, it is it it it, it uh, adds to our own life and work satisfaction. So yeah. it's not just right the the importance of being trusted to make decisions, but also what that does on the individuals who trust yeah. and are able to trust. You know, Paula, I appreciate you putting that sharper point on it because it reminds me that, you know, I am convinced, so we, we need to do hard things um, as an institution uh, coming out of a pandemic uh, when, you know, higher ed has probably never been more challenged. And, and yet, if we want people, we need people to do hard things um and if we if we make people authentically feel that leadership i hear that a lot leadership i'm always like who are you talking about are you talking about me 
who, who is leadership, but, or the senior administration, I hear that a lot too. Um, if, if there's a belief that, th that people are not cared for and trust and care go together, um, I think it's very hard to expect people to do, to do hard things, to hang in there with you, to fight the good fight. But if you, people honestly do feel cared for, if they do feel like this is a place that actually cares about me as a person, not just as a utility to get something done, but as a person, and you show me that grace, then those people that feel that way, they're willing to go pretty far for you. And that's the type of spirit and culture that I think together, all of us, are trying to build here. I know all of us stand for that. I think there are some folks that don't necessarily feel that. I think we have to be honest about that. And I think we have to work really hard to change that within realism. You can't give everybody everything they want. But at the end of the day, if there's trust and then care, we can accomplish pretty amazing things as a community. And we already are, but our, our, I think really our limits are boundless if we can create that kind of an environment and that type of a community. And I don't think we're that far away. And I think it's absolutely something that we can and should do. And I think St. Ignatius would be proud. So Terry, um, we're, we're in March, we're in the month of March, which means that we're heading towards Mission Week, we're heading towards Maryland Day. And this is a time where as a university, uh, for folks who might not know, um, you obviously know, um, but for folks who, who might not know, Mission Week is an opportunity for us to come together to celebrate the mission for all the ways that it's animated here at Loyola um, and for having conversations about ways where maybe we could live this more fully. Um, I think it's a way we uplift people who are animating the mission, the way we name what we're hoping for in the mission. Um, of celebrating people who are living it out. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. And then I'm curious, as you think about mission, as the president of a Jesuit Catholic University, what is your hope for Loyola in this time, in either this Ignatian year or as we're moving into the future, um, whether that's around mission or just your general hope for our, our community? Yeah. Well, you know, there are about 4,500 colleges and universities in America. Um, they all have a mission, I would hope, I would think. Um, I can't name them all. Um, there's 27 Jesuit colleges and universities. I, can, I could name them all. Um, and we're blessed to be part of what I think is the most important academic um, set of institutions in the United States, and definitely institutions part of the oldest continuous educational tradition in the history of the world. If you work here, that's where you work. That's what you're a part of. I, I tell everyone, I don't care what your job is, you're an educator. Regardless of your job, you, are an, you might not be a teacher, you might not be a professor, but you're an educator. Because we're all contributing to an enterprise that ultimately educates students in the Jesuit Catholic tradition which is really important and sacred. Um, so getting everyone to understand that, to understand the importance of that, that when you show up to work, that that's what you are contributing to is important. And I think Mission Week is an opportunity for us to make that clear. If we don't, I think it's a missed opportunity because when people feel part of something greater than themselves, when they, feel, when they feel part of something that is ultimately good for the world. There is a fulfillment to that, that again, increases productivity, increases personal fulfillment of those individuals, which we want that for our people that work here and give their time. We want that for our students. And so Mission Week, I think is a real opportunity to reflect on just how, how, how significant, how relevant, how needed, how sacred our mission is. But, you know, it requires a certain level of understanding beyond the cannonball story, right? Which is what we give at orientation. St. Ignatius was a regular dude, got hit in the leg with a cannonball and that changed everything. We need, we need to find ways for our community to go deeper, not to proselytize, but to explain to them 
This is what we are as a Jesuit university, and it matters to us. It's not just slogans. It, um, it, it impacts the way we proceed. It impacts the way we comport ourselves, the way we make decisions, what guides us, what drives our agenda. Um, we have our true north. We don't have to have a retreat or a summit to discuss and figure out what is our mission going to be. Some institutions have to wrestle with that. Some institutions change their mission. That's not us. We know what our mission is. It's how can we execute it in the way that's most faithful to us and to what we're capable of doing and how to best serve God, right? AMDG, all for the greater glory of God. And so that's what Mission Week, I hope, does, but it can't accomplish it in a week. The hope is that it whets the appetite. It creates some momentum for us to be intentional, intentional about our efforts to go deeper because ultimately, when that, when that happens, um, as I said earlier, um, it opens up the prospects and a level of commitment that's even deeper than what we see. Um, and it gets us through those tough times, which will always come. Um, it, it's, it gives you that, that, um, that wind to, to keep you um, elevated. Uh, it has certainly been my reservoir um, that I dip into when I'm feeling um, desolation, um, just to be reminded why we do this and how lucky we are. I mean, I feel lucky every day to do this job. And we need to remind people of that, that it's a pretty special tradition. So that's what I hope out of Michigan. That's a big, that's a tall order, Sean. So I hope you're up for it. I, I, have, can to, do it. I have to say, Terry, that I, I love that you keep, um, cup, it, bringing us back to that reality check because as I have grown and I, I, I have grown spiritually in my eight times at Loyola by diving deeper into the mission and really understanding that there's even joy in moments that we are, we experience desolation because those moments where we experience desolation, we're able to see a reality and be able to go past that reality and knowing that we're able to do that brings me great joy and I, I I hope that as you say you know people go beyond the superficial to get to that core of Ignatian spirituality that is just an endless resource of joy if you really understand it correctly and um, and I really appreciate um, your groundedness um, I understanding that you know there as always will be tough decisions that need to happen and that there's this amazing part of our mission and our culture here at Loyola that we can all go to um, to extract joy and understanding to push us forward so thank you so much for that I think that is so wonderful that, to have that perspective um, and I really appreciate that you took the time to be with us today. Uh, I, I think that maybe Sean may want to say any something about Mission Week uh, before we leave. Well, I, I uh, we we have a lot of opportunities, and and we'll make sure that there are links uh, with the podcast for people to access uh, for a, a number of the events that are happening throughout Mission Weeks. Mission Week, um, there'll be advertising across the university. But I, I, I do want to also add my thanks, Terry, for you joining us today in this conversation and for sharing, um, a, a, you know, opening the door and sharing a little bit of your connection with Ignatius, with Ignatian spirituality, the way that it informs your leadership. And I want to thank you for also talking about the connection of trust um, at a university where I think so many people come here because they do believe in this, this idea of the modest. They really want to work for a more just and humane world. And <clears throat> I think we're all very, very driven. We have loving people, very compassionate people, and people who are very hard on themselves when we don't make that mark. Um, I think we're very quick to review and say where we are not living into our yeah. mission. And so that idea of trust, how are we trusting that we are together in this mission? Um, how are we trusting that, um, uh, that we are advancing the mission? And how are we trusting that God is capable 
of moving us forward in our mission, I think is always an important reminder. And so I, I really thank you. Thank you for also naming that we have to care for each other because especially when that trust is broken, um, the trust in how we're living that out, um, how we feel cared for, how do yeah. we make sure that we're demonstrating that care? So um, yeah. thank you for naming those today in our conversation. Well, it's been my pleasure. Again, I have such great admiration and affection for both of you. Uh, and I'm just so grateful for the work that you do for this podcast that you've been doing. I've watched all the episodes. I will not be watching this one because <laughs> I don't like to watch myself. Um, but uh, Courtney can watch it. She'll tell me how it went. Uh, and um, I just so grateful for the work that you do uh, in animating our mission in the lives of so many uh, members of our community. So thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you very you much. So